Good morning and welcome to the 27th meeting of the Education, Children and Young People Committee in 2024. Today we have apologies from Stephanie Callaghan. We welcome Jackie Dunbar, who is attending as committee substitute. I would like to welcome Douglas Ross and Miles Briggs, who are joining us this morning for the first time, and replacing our previous colleagues, Sue Webber and Liam Kerr. <coughs> On behalf of the committee, I wish to thank Sue and Liam for their contribution to the work the committee has done this session. As Douglas and Miles are joining us for the first time today, our first item of business will be to invite them to declare any relevant interests. And Douglas, can I ask you first? Uh, nothing to declare. Thanks. And Miles? Thank you, Deputy Convener. Nothing to declare as well. Thank you. The committee's next task is to choose a convener. The Parliament has agreed that only members <coughs> excuse me, of the Scottish Conservative and Unionist Party are eligible for nomination as convener. I understand that the Conservative nominee for convener is Douglas Ross. Do we agree to choose Douglas Ross as our convener? Thank you. I will now hand over to Douglas to convene the rest of the meeting. Thank you very much, uh, Evelyn, for your duties there, uh, and good morning, everyone, uh, to this meeting. Could I also echo what Evelyn said about the contribution uh, of Liam Kerr? Uh, as a member of this committee, he did uh, sterling work, uh, I think, and for the last two and a half years, Sue Weber has been an excellent convener, uh, and I look forward to continuing the good work uh, that Sue has done over that period uh, with the current members and, obviously, previous members. Uh, now, let's move on to today's main item of business, which is an evidence session on the reform of the senior phase. The report of the Independent Review of Qualifications and Assessment was published in June 2023 and the committee heard evidence from Professor Hayward, the chair of the review group and her colleagues in September of last year. And following the publication of the Scottish Government's response to the report last month, we've invited Professor Hayward and members of the Independent Review Group back for a further update. So could I warmly wel welcome Professor Louise Hayward, Professor of Education, Assessment and Innovation, University of Glasgow and Chair of the Independent Review of Qualifications and Assessment. Dr Douglas Hutchison, Executive Director of Education Services at Glasgow City Council, who led the review's local government group. Peter Bain, Executive Head Teacher and President of the School Leaders Scotland, who led the School Leaders Group. And Shona Barry, Director of Admissions and Access, University of Stirling who was a member of the university group. Uh, and I'd now like to invite Professor Hayward to make an opening statement to the committee before we move to members' questions. Professor Hayward. Thank you very much, Mr Ross. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to discuss how progress might be made in relation to qualification and assessment reform. There is widespread recognition um, of the need for and the importance of change. The current system is not getting it right for every child. We welcome the next steps identified by the Cabinet Secretary and outlined in the paper that was sent to you. We understand the caution in the current financial context and look forward to the statement later this year that will integrate qualifications and assessment reform into the wider improvement agenda. I'm going to identify four things, though, that keep me awake at night. The first one is that young people are going through the system just now. And yesterday, uh, young people were talking about qualifications, saying the same thing that we heard during the review, the same things that OECD said. Graham Hutton, at a previous evidence session with the group, indicated that 20% of young people in Scotland leave education without one national five. We have examples of, uh, so we understand the caution because of the, the financial circumstances, but because of that, we have to be really creative about how to move things on. We have examples of what has worked well in the past in reform, and we should learn from that. We should agree what to stop doing. We should root out areas where there are overlap, where different parts of the system are doing similar things. Be very clear about who's best placed to do what and how decisions are taken. And we should draw on the wide range of groups and organisations who are part of the wider educational landscape and engage them in the process. The second thing that keeps me awake is that we lose a sense of purpose. 
why we undertook the review, what the challenges it set out to face, and how the recommendations were identified as ways of addressing these challenges. If we separate the purpose, the vision, from the actions we take, we end up simply with a list of things to do. Vision is everything. It's why things matter. It drives what you do to design the system, how you put ideas into practice, how you track progress over time, and the actions that you would then take to alter policy and practice to make sure that you keep to that vision. If you lose that connection, then all the problems that we identified at the beginning of the, view of the paper that you have in front of you are likely to return. And like the myths of Sisyphus, will be condemned forever to roll boulders uphill, only to have them roll back down again. A third thing that keeps me awake is the fact that societal changes may outpace the system's ability to change. The report recommended a different approach to change, the change process, and that was informed by leading international researchers on the community collaborative group led by Professor Chris Chapman. It linked the pace of change to capacity, the resource to support the change resource to support the change is essential. But since the review was initially commissioned, chat GPT came on the scene and the radical changes in society that have started as a result of that. Within the last couple of weeks, O1 has appeared, which is open access AI um, that is one of the first of a series of reasoning models of artificial intelligence that have been trained to answer more complex questions faster than a human can. There's a danger of moving too quickly. There's also a danger of moving too slowly. We need to get that right. And the last thing that keeps me awake is that we repeat the mistakes of the past, that we lose the opportunity to change the culture. It's our future was designed to demonstrate what cultural change could look like, as advocated in the Muir report. If ideas aren't related to a model for change, then quickly they separate off vision from practice and we get into a system of repeating old mistakes. The Independent Review Group was set up to build capacity for change through the process of change itself. It began by working with learners to develop the vision. It engaged all the communities who have to be involved in the process through the independent review and the community collaborative groups. It worked through problems together to get approaches that people across communities could live with. All of these communities remain crucial and it's important that we look to the future we hold that in mind and it doesn't become simply an issue for schools to take on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Hayward. Uh, there's a number of areas that the committee wants to look at uh, today with you and your fellow witnesses. Can I just begin by asking you and, and others to come in if they wish. What is your uh, view of the response from the Scottish Government to your report? I think that we welcome the areas where the Scottish Government has already identified that um, changes will begin. Um, we worry a little about um, the decision to, um, to hold the National Five examination. The reason we worry about that is that it leaves the problem of what's often described as the two-term dash um, unaddressed. So what we need to do, there are many ways to approach these challenges, but what we need to, be, to see clearly is what approach is going to be put in place that will address that issue of the two-term dash. Um, I think the, the, the digital profile, so in the paper we listed mm -hmm. the range of things that have to be done. Um, and while welcoming these, I think in my opening statement, um, I identified where I think the areas where further action needs to be taken to ensure that this time we get it right for every child.
And, and you spoke about the, the next statement that will come from the Cabinet Secretary. Did you expect more in the initial response? You, you mentioned a couple of times in your opening statement there about what keeps you awake at night. Are, are you still being kept awake at night because you don't believe the Government have responded as fully or as quickly to your report? I think it's difficult to answer that question because I haven't heard what's coming in December. No. It may be that in December, and I do understand that, um, I, th I think there is a misunderstanding in that people keep talking about the fact that there are so many different reviews. But actually, these are like, it's a bit like a, a jigsaw box. <laughs> these are the pieces of the jigsaw that, when put together, give you that overarching vision. Now, what I'm hoping for in December is that we see that overarching vision where the national discussion, the vision from the national discussion, um, how that develops in terms of curriculum, how that links to qualifications, and how skills and knowledge are brought together as advocated in Withers, that we see that big picture. Then I would be able to answer that question more directly. The, the Children Commissioner was quite critical of the initial Scottish Government response. Do you, do you think that was fair? She said there was um, a you know, there was a failure to mention set timelines uh, or resources to be allocated, and she said the Cabinet Secretary's statement showed a lack of commitment. Would you agree with the Children's Commissioner? I think that, um, again, we'd be better able to answer that question after the December statement. Mm -hmm. um, I do understand that we are living in very constrained financial circumstances, and so care has to be given in terms of thinking about um, how best to make progress. As I said in the opening statement, I think that that um, requires a degree of creativity. It isn't simply about allocating an existing, a, a new budget to necessarily to particular tasks. So I'm hoping that what's going on in the background just now is, are these creative processes of finding ways to make sure that these ideas can be taken forward um, I think it's really important that in the December statement, that's what we're looking for. We're looking for this holistic vision, how qualifications and assessment will link to that, and really importantly, the practical steps that will be taken in order to turn ideas into reality. Was it always your understanding that there would be the initial response from the government and then one uh, a few months later? Because I think a lot of what we'll be discussing today will be uh, dependent on what is eventually then said by the Cabinet Secretary in December. Could, could some of this not have been said initially in the, the response a couple of months ago? I think at the beginning of the review, um, the, the very difficult financial circumstances simply weren't there. Mm -hmm. I think that it was during the review that the financial context changed. Um, and so um, always someone who looks at a glass half full rather than half empty, mm -hmm. then um, I'm assuming that what's happening just now is that a little more time is being taken just now to make sure that there are practical strategies in place that can um, take forward the ideas. But it is very important um, that we look at this holistically and it isn't appropriate to simply cherry pick bits um, because our past experience of doing that leads to a situation where often where we end up is very different from where we intended to go. So in December, on, on your words here with, about cherry picking, if the Cabinet Secretary accept some but not all of your recommendations to take forward, you would be disappointed that type of cherry picking is not what, what you're hoping for? It would depend, I think. It would depend in, uh, as to whether the Cabinet Secretary um, identified in that statement other ways of tackling the challenges. Um, the, you know, the, the Independent Review Group came up with a set of proposals um, for how things might be taken forward. Um, why change? what that change might look like, and, crucially, how change might happen. Now, um, it may be that, um, through further discussion, some of the issues, for example, the two how you cope with the two-term dash and National Five, could be approached in a different way. So it may be that, in December, again, the Cabinet Secretary would come up with an alternative approach to that. But it really is about that connection between what are the issues we're facing as a, as a nation in relation to qualifications and assessment, what action are we going to take in order to address these issues, 
and then how are we going to make sure that we move forward apace in a way that supports every learner in the country, um, but also um, supports Scotland as a nation and protects our future socially, culturally and economically. Okay. Before I take in Pam Duncan Glancy, do any other witnesses want to say anything about the response from the Scottish Government to the review? Dr Hutchinson. It was, it was really just to say that the, the response is, is facilitative in a sense that the door is still open for um, anybody who wants to, to, to pilot or trial aspects of the recommendations. We are having conversations in Glasgow and in the West Partnership about uh, the Diploma of Achievement or something similar at a local level. And the West Partnership is 38 per cent of the population of Scotland. And so the door is open for anyone to trial. Your Scottish Government were clear there isn't a pile of money to be able to uh, deliver a programme, but the door is open uh, for anybody who is willing to uh, look at aspects of the report uh, and almost get a proof of concept uh, and begin to build a coalition or a consensus around aspects of the report. So we are certainly investigating or, or discussing aspects of the recommendations uh, locally and the Scottish Government response was facilitative in that sense that left the door open uh, at local level to trial. Okay. Mr Bain. Uh, if you don't mind. Uh, the view of school leaders that I meet with regularly through School Leaders Scotland or groups like Bosch or indeed head teachers in my own local authority is one of frustration with the pace of change. I, I have had the opportunity to discuss with the Cabinet Secretary on a number of occasions the fiscal challenges <coughs> and that seems to be the main driver for the lack of progress with taking forward the 26 recommendations from uh, the report. And we understand that that is a crucial consideration. However, Louise was talking about vision and the importance of vision. And I think we have to go back to the OECD report in its first instance, and then Muir, both of which I was involved in, eh, both individually and through groups. The current system does not work for the young people in our society. We do need to make changes, and we need to make substantial change to the education provision in, in relation to qualifications and assessment, because the qualifications and assessment are driving the curriculum and warping our curriculum and changing the curriculum to one that is not best suited towards 21st century society in Scotland. We need to address the two-term dash. We need to uh, consider a three-year examination system that Professor Stobart uh, made clear wasn't. Uh, we're the only country in the world that examines kids three years in a row, for example. By investigating that and making that change, it will allow more time for us to develop uh, a wider range of courses and deliver in a more appropriate manner that allows our children to learn subject material, knowledge and skills that best place them for the workplace or university or colleges thereafter. We don't do that just now. We're teaching to the test. We have been for 100 years. We need to stop that. We, we know that that is a problem. OECD said that. Muir said that. It's picked up in Hayward and Withers reports. And actually, there's elements of the Morgan report that uh, pick that up with regard to ASN as well. We know that's a fault. We need to address it now. There, are, uh, there is the report that the Scottish Government produced. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary did a, a survey almost of uh, society, the education system, and there, there are views that say that that's not necessarily a good thing. What I, would, what I would ask is that we consider what we discovered through the independent review group and the community collaboratives that we did, that when we investigate a way forward and we discuss the ideology and the practicalities of a way forward with a group of people, whoever it is, whether it's the kids, whether it's parents, whether it's businesses, or whether it's school leaders and teachers, when you have that discussion and then you ask them the question, should we change the examination system? The answer is a resounding yes, because they've been party to that discussion of understanding. Just going out and carrying a survey without that quality of discussion creates quite a different response. Professor Hayward was very clear that the community collaborative groups that covered businesses, parents, partners, universities, colleges, etc., carried out that function in that manner. 
And what the school leaders would like to see through the groups I'm involved with is a, a repeat of that type of exercise in looking to de develop the devil in the detail to each of the recommendations. There is not a significant financial commitment to go into stage two of teasing out the devil in the detail of which recommendations would work and which wouldn't. By not progressing with that, the implementation groups and the investigation of what would work or not, we are holding back the change process in Scottish education that we have all identified does not work. A recommendation through SLS and Bosch, etc., would be that we move forward with implementation groups in the same format as the independent review group of qualifications and assessment and actually get to the nitty gritty of how could we make the change that is so necessary. Thank you. Ms. <clears throat> I mean, we recognise that not everybody leaving school in Scotland wants to go into university, but should they want to, they are going to enter an environment, a very diverse learning environment with students from across the sector, 140 different countries. Now, students in those countries will be coming in from different education systems, some of which are really investing in different types of assessment and learning, and some of them moving away from examination assessment and having a different balance of internal external self-assessment, peer assessment, so a real variety of different things. And as universities, we're really open to, to that because it's not necessarily just about the knowledge that you gain through a subject-specific exam, but it's about the holistic view of your skills and your knowledge and your abilities and your competencies that we look for that would look for us to identify who's going to be a successful student, so to come in, do well, succeed and have a good graduate outcome. So I guess the concern from the higher education sector is that our Scottish entrants coming in, there's a risk that they fall behind students coming from other countries within that diverse learning environment. And so that's why we would be supportive of reform of the, the senior phase. Thank you. Uh, Pam. Thank you, um, convener. Good morning um, to the panel. Thank you for the questions you've answered so far and also for the information you've submitted in advance. Um, Professor Hayward, you said that um, I think I wrote down vision is everything, um, and that one of the things that were keeping you up at night was that, the, that there is the potential to lose a sense of, of purpose without without that. So I want to go back to the vision um, that, that was set out in the report, where you've said an inclusive and highly regarded qualifications and assessment system that inspires learning and values the diverse achievements of every learner. So it's a bit a bit longer than that, but for, for the purposes of this morning, can I ask does in the absence of any vision from the Scottish Government at this point, do you get any sense from the, the response so far, not, not waiting until December, but so far, that the Government understands that vision and share it? I suppose that if you look at um, other policies, then the idea of you know, getting it right for every child, the, the that there is a sense that that's the aspiration, although um, I think I keep going back to December, but I think it's waiting to December until we see that that vision in place. I think there is though uh, a need to think about. So I think in December, what I, I, I anticipate is that there will be an overall vision statement about the future of of Scottish education, but then within that. There has to be, I think, the question, so how will assessment and qualifications contribute to that vision? And what you read out there, I think, is what we need absolutely front and centre of all discussions. And there's also a tendency, one of the mistakes we've made in the past is that um, in curriculum, when we're reforming things, we talk about what we're trying to do, the purpose at the beginning. Mm. But then, almost like hamsters on a wheel, we get caught up in activity and we do things and we lose sense of why we're doing things. So the vision has to stay um, right the way through and we keep coming back to that to say, are these actions actually serving this vision? Are the um, new approaches to assessment and qualifications inspiring learners? Do these projects give them a sense of purpose in what they're learning that perhaps they didn't previously get? Um, is everyone involved in this process? Are the are young people who have severe and complex learning difficulties included in that process in the same way 
And are the, the, the young people with um, uh, most abilities, are they being challenged now? So what we do is we use that vision as the touchstone for every action we take and the basis by which we judge every action we take in terms of its effectiveness. So can I, can I ask um, Professor Hayward and, and other members of the panel then, on each part of that vision, the inclusive qualifications assessment, the ins inspiration of learning and the values of diverse experience, um, achievement rather, does the government response give any confidence that in each of those areas there could be an improvement? So, for example, around um, the government's response to the, the pathway, um, the government's response to um, the exams and whether or not um, they're going to retain them. Does that, do, do you get the sense that it's going to resolve any of the problems that we've heard? Um, Peter Bain, you said that the, the curriculum was warped, I think you said, um, by the assessment process. Do you get any sense that, that what the Cabinet Secretary set out understands the scale of the challenge and will resolve, uh, will deliver on those parts of the, the vision? I think the Cabinet Secretary and the response has given a nod to the issue. Uh, and with, again, without seeing the December statement, which is going to have more detail, uh, more substance to it, I'm led to believe. But at the current time, uh, no. I think that that vision has to be one in which we provide an education system for all pupils and not just those who are going to uni. The current qualifications and assessment and the way in which we measure that is driven towards measuring what's referred to as five plus. How many kids can get five hires and how many kids can we get through five hires and let's produce a curriculum in schools and in local authorities that will allow the best or the highest percentage of those getting five plus so we can uh, we can show that we're going up and down league, artificial league tables. I mean, the Scottish Government don't publish the league tables. They publish the information that the, the media use. But then society uses the league tables. By doing that, we're missing about 60 to 70 per cent of the population. What hasn't been picked up, I, I believe, uh, so far, is the whole concept of parity of esteem and the qualifications and assessment framework that war it does warp, absolutely warps our curricular delivery because we're trying to hit five plus or we're mm. trying to hit percentage pass rates that have A to C pass rates. So traditional courses like my own history, English, maths, etc., all have A to C pass rates and we all and schools are driven towards getting these types of qualifications, and traditional qualifications. But I would argue, you know, what's more important to a young person, my higher history or a, a, a national progression award in hospitality or construction or engineering that would actually serve them better in getting a job. But those types of qualifications do not pick up the same tariff points or they don't feature necessarily in, uh, in other metrics that we're using. Parity of esteem has not been picked up as possibly the, the central focus it should be to change the qualification assessment, assessment system for the benefit of all pupils. Uh, Louise mentioned in her statement that Graham Hutton was here uh, a few weeks ago talking about only 20% or 20% of kids don't pick up uh, you know, one national. That's true. And, and you mentioned the personal pathway. I think uh, Convener mentioned the personal pathway. We're talking about the personal pathway part of the STA and the negative uh, connotations are being bandied about with that, saying that you know the middle classes will benefit from the promotion of the personal pathway because if you've got money, you can get your kids skiing trips or you can get them gold awards at DOV, etc. But actually, the personal pathway was the one thing that the parents and the pupils who were involved in the very extensive discussions towards putting together the STA they were most keen about that because at the moment we do not recognise the successes and the, the skills that are being developed by many young people who are not necessarily receiving a traditional education, a high, you know, higher history or whatever, in the school. But we are delivering experiences or work experience or interpersonal experience or IT or whatever it is that they need to make their way in the world and best place them to go into the workplace. We are delivering that in schools now. We are delivering personal pathways, but in no shape or form do we significantly say to society, here's what we Jimmy or we Bessie has achieved through doing these experiences that we are putting on at school. 
Nowhere does it do that, and that has been completely missed uh, so far, and we need to address that right now. So, in, in not in, in doing that part of the, the review, um, the Cabinet Secretary said that she would, I think she would look at it um, and, and look at some of the implications of it. And I'm struck by some of the evidence that we've had previously, possibly from Professor Hayward, where we said once you lift the lid on this, you see there, there, you see there could be a problem, you either close it and move on, or you leave the lid off and try and, try and fix it. So, for the 20% of young people who are leaving without um, NAP fives, not doing that then seems to be quite quite problematic. Is there anything at all in the government response that you think can help with that 20% of people in the absence of that? We would have to await the more expansive reply in December, but at the current time, no. OK, thank you. Um, do I have time for one more? Yep. Thank, thank you, convener. Um, I, I wondered, um, Douglas Hutchison, um, if, it's, if it's OK to ask, what, what's been the reaction from local leaders and, and education leaders to the response um, from the Cabinet Secretary um, in terms of the delivery of the vision, which I know many were bought into? Um, it, it, it's largely reflected in what I said earlier. You know, like, um, how can we take forward the principles and the vision uh, implicit, uh, well, explicit uh, in the review. Um, ADES as an organisation is very committed to the principles of the Hayward Review and committed to seeing them taken forward. But we are all involved in the challenges of delivering public services in a context, in an extremely challenging fiscal context. So we can absolutely understand, as I said earlier, there isn't a shed load of money to throw at um, uh, at a report. So, I mean, almost all directors have been teachers before, and I'd have to say teachers are very practical people. Uh, and so the discussions are about how can we um, chart a way forward that picks up on the vision and the principles, because as Louise said, the vision is really important. Um, I mean, in a conversation, Louise, I was saying that, you know, people think the vision and the principles are fluffy stuff. But the vision uh, is, is charting the way forward. The, the, it's describing the type of awards and qualification system that we want for our, our young people. And, you know, that, that first line, qualifi qualifications and assessment system that inspires learning. Mm -hmm. You know, it, is that what we have just now? And again, to go back to your question about, um, because a lot of the questions have been about the Cabinet Secretary's response or the Scottish Government's response, implicit in that question is a view that responsibility lies entirely with the Cabinet Secretary or the Scottish Government. There's a lot in this report that speaks to the entire education system. You know, it's largely teachers who are the, you know, appointees and markers and set, you know, for the SQA. The SQA wouldn't function without teachers. And as teachers, we've had some responsibility in driving the system in the direction that it finds itself in now. Um, so it is equally for all of us in the system uh, to acknowledge uh, our part in uh, a high-stakes exam system that, that we have at the moment, and it's equally got to be um, our responsibility to do to chart uh, ways forward to to get to uh, delivery of a qualifications and assessment system that inspires <coughs> learning. You know, I keep thinking of that Christopher Brookmeyer quote where he's, uh, one of his characters is saying that um, she hated school. She hated uh, the syllabus that was so exam-focused that learning for its own sake was seen as a decadent luxury. And that's a Christopher Brookmeyer quote, but I think it sums up um, what a lot of people uh, think who have gone through the system, that learning for its own sake is a decadent luxury. Um, so it's up to all of us in the system to, to dismantle that and chart a way forward that delivers for the 21st century. So, um, ADES and uh, directors of education, I think, have been hugely positive about the vision and the principles, but see that it's our collective responsibility, and the responsibility doesn't just lie uh, with uh, the Cabinet Secretary or the Scottish Government in terms of delivery uh, on the vision and principles. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Evelyn. Thanks, Kevina. 
Uh, good morning, panel, and thanks for all your answers so far. They've been very helpful. Um, Professor Hayward, you have made a few comments in your opening statements and in your answers. Um, we should agree to stop what we should agree to stop doing. Um, the three years of exams, uh, the two-term dash, and I'm particularly interested in the National Five qualifications. Now, um, what are your views on the retention of those, and if it was to change, what might an alternative pr approach look like? OK, thank you. Um, as I indicated at the beginning, that the saying that the, the group's decision to recommend that um, there wouldn't be an external exam at National Five was a response to a problem. The problem being that um, for, for this isn't just since the OECD. You know, for the last 20 years, we've been hearing that um, having three sets of examinations um, leads to what's termed the two-term dash. So a lot of rehearsal for examinations, past papers, prelims. In the review, we found some schools were having three sets of prelims in a year. You know, it, it's really difficult to identify where that learning that uh, Douglas was describing actually uh, takes place. So th the idea was that what would happen is that instead of there being an examination at the end of S4, that young people, as they progress through the course, they would build up credit. It would be a two-year programme. You would build up credit as you went through the two years. That would mean that no need for prelims in, in S4, no need for rehearsal and past papers. All of that would go. And that time then could be about, I hate the thought of learning, deep learning being an indulgence, um, but it would allow for that deeper learning that would help learners to learn more effectively and to enjoy the process of learning. It would also take some of the pressure from teachers, you know, who are constantly in this kind of um, hamster wheel of responding to the, the, the needs of the examination. So th the alternative was that, as with National 4 just now, that um, young people would build up credit over time. And if the expectation would be, because most young people stay on now until the end of fifth year and the end of sixth year. That's the reality. We don't have a system anymore where, as in the past, lots of young people left at the end of, of S4. But for those who decided that they had taken a subject that actually they didn't want to go on to the second year with, then they could leave with the credit they had accumulated that would give them the equivalent of that qualification at National Five. So that was the very pragmatic way of dealing with the problem of the two-term dash. Okay, thank you. If you don't mind, I'll come in with a, a practical illustration of the problem, in S4 in particular. <clears throat> There are 39 school weeks. If you assume, and this is maybe not the same in every school, but certainly most schools, that the last week of Christmas and the last week of summer, there's a very low attendance. So let's knock off a couple straight away. You're down to 37. The terms are split from uh, the summer to October holiday and then to Christmas and then to Easter and then to the start of the exams, which, uh, and because of changes in the, the SQA timetable, uh, actually the SQA exams this year started immediately after the holidays. And there's a big, or it was going to, there's a big argument over, we need to get the kids back into school for at least a week before the exams kick off. Most courses at NAT5 are divided into sort of three sections, three units, most of them, not all of them. You're aiming to start your course after the exam, so you start your course in June, but then that's when all the trips are, and uh, so it's a, a fragmented start. You tend to really start properly as soon as you come back. You've got eight weeks to the October holidays to teach a course, but you're going to start doing your Unit 1 assessments in the last week before you break up. 
and part of that would be in preparation for getting ready for your prelim, which will depend on the school. We'll start on the first week in uh, the last week in November or the first week in December usually. So you've got an assessment week. So you've actually taught the kids for seven weeks and then you've had an assessment week. But they've only actually had seven weeks learning. And part of that will be preparing for the assessment in week eight. So maybe you've only had six weeks learning prep for the assessment, then the assessment week. You've had six weeks learning so far. You're in October. You then come back for your week or your two weeks holiday in October. You've got another eight to nine weeks, in our case eight weeks, to Christmas. But you've only got seven because nothing happens in terms of attainment in the last week because we're all doing Christmas shows or Christmas concerts or whatever. And that's just part of society and that's a good thing. Education is not just about exams. But you've only got seven weeks. But within that seven weeks, you've got a two-week prelim period. And to, prefer, to make sure the kids actually do well in their prelims, every department will take a week to prepare for the prelims. So that's three. So in that eight-week block, you've taken out three for assessment, one for societal. Good stuff. You've only taught for four weeks. So you've taught for seven weeks or six weeks in the first one, the first bit of the term, and then four. So we've now only taught 10 weeks of knowledge and skills acquisition, and we're at Christmas, and we've only done 10 weeks learning. We then come back, you've got the higher uh, prelims usually when you come back for the holidays, and the same thing's repeated. In that Easter period, that's when most of the learning gets done, and we're in a, a unit two, stroke three by then, and we have to do uh, unit assessments, and then we have to do prelims as well because the exams are going to start as soon as we come back for Easter now. There used to be delayed. There used to be time after Easter. There's not now. So in that 13 to 14 week block, oh, and there's a February holiday chucked in there as well, so you're down to 12 or 13. So we'll just say 12 at the moment. You need two weeks. You need a week for your, your unit assessments. You need another two weeks for your prelims, because you can't do all your prelim stuff. And you've not taught the course, so you can't do the full prelim pre-Christmas, you have to do a third or a half of the prelim after Christmas. So there's three weeks in that 12-week block taken up for assessment as well. So you've now got nine. So we've, and then you're into the exams. So in a 39-week sorry, a 39-week school year, I've just demonstrated that we're only actually teaching half of that time. We're only developing skills and knowledge acquisition for half the time much of that is taken out because we are teaching to tests or we're making sure they're getting ready for unit assessments or prelims. That has to stop. And the way to stop that is to move to the, the, the solution that Louise has just outlined in her statement. But that's what happens in almost every school in the country. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Ross. Very much. And <clears throat> just to follow up on, on exactly that point, um, your recommendations were to replace the current model for NAT5 of the high stakes end of term exam with a continuous assessment model. The government has instead decided to add continuous assessment to the system as it currently exists. Do you have any concerns about that or do you think that continuous assessment can work as an add-on to the exam system? Does, does it have to be one or the other or is there a way that both being done in the same year can, can work? I think it's one to keep an eye on to see um, actually what happens. It would require, it depends if we, how we see the continuous assessment. If it is um, built up um, across the course of the year, and if as a result of that, the, what's contained in the examination is significantly reduced, so the examination itself is much shorter and more focused, um, then it could be possible. Um, but there's another possibility, which is it, that it expands the workload rather than, rather than contracts it. So I think that um, it's, if that is the proposal, um, then again, we need a bit more detail about how it will actually, what the balance will look like and um, how we ensure that um, it doesn't simply become what you described at the beginning as an add-on. It has to be a complete rebalancing um, of, of the profile. I think it's really interesting to think, I mean, if you remember in Gordon Stobart's report, he talked about something that, that I think sometimes we forget, and that's that 
exams are embedded in our culture. And, and, and so we, can, we attribute um, a, a, a gravitas around them, when actually there's simply one way of gathering evidence. And so what we're looking at is across the year to see, let's um, expand the range of ways that we gather evidence um, and see if we can address the issue of um, giving more time for teaching. Um, but it's, it, it is tricky and it's one that we're going to have to keep a very close eye on to make sure that it actually does achieve what it's setting out to achieve, which is to solve that particular challenge. If I could just ask, I'd be interested in Peter and Douglas's feedback on, on that as well, and specifically on, because we've focused quite rightly very much on the impact on the learner, the, the young person. Are there implications in terms of workload for teachers here uh, if this is added on to the current system as opposed to replacing it at that five? My quick answer would be absolutely yes. Not necessarily because of the additional uh, internal assessment. The internal assessment has to take place naturally anyway. That's why I don't believe that we necessarily have to have final exams. Teachers need to assess your children to evaluate how they're getting on in the course and their level of learning so the teacher can then put in the next building block of the learning. We have to assess as we go. We're, I mentioned that we still do unit assessments or end the unit assessments naturally to make sure that that happens so they're ready for their exams. If it was formalised, that would still have to take place. The teachers would just replace whatever internal assessment, unit assessment they're doing just now with the formalised one. So there wouldn't necessarily be a, a work uh, impact on that. There would be definitely an increase in the workload because of the bureaucracy surrounding the formality of the national unit assessment programme that would have to be put in place rather than the natural unit assessment that's necessary for the teacher to determine how best to support the child moving forward. Thanks very much. Douglas, do you have anything to add on that one? No, uh, uh, just to agree with Peter. I mean, like, in terms of a case study, the second year of COVID, when we had the alternative certification model where there were no exams, teachers complained then there was a, an enormous amount of assessment going on in schools. So we need to get the balance right um, for the sake of young people so that they are not over-assessed and equally so that the burden doesn't simply fall back on teachers. But in terms of that balance between final exams and uh, continuous assessment. I mean, young people themselves like exams, you know, like they like the idea that they know they've got something to work towards them, you know, like, so it's not that anybody's saying, let's get rid of exams. Um, there are different views out there. I hear that from young people themselves. I meet groups of senior pupils uh, regularly and, and they're divided on it. So it's not simply about saying it's one or the other, but it is about rebalancing. And I mean, I think that was clear in the government response and it's clear in here. But the workload issue is completely one we need to uh, keep an eye on because it was clear in the alternative certification model year. But it was also clear a few years ago, just when Mr Swinney became Cabinet Secretary, that was one of the hot topics in his entry, the, the burden uh, of assessment time on teachers due to unit assessments and so on. So it's something that we would continue to, we would need to uh, monitor. Thank you. Just one final question. Uh, Professor Herbert, you um, used, a, 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 I thought, quite a helpful metaphor a few moments ago uh, to talk about the, the jigsaw that all these reviews uh, add up together uh, to make. And if, one, if there was an, an origin point to this process, it was the OECD review. I mean, really, this has been ongoing for decades. Uh, um, but where we are now kind of came from, from the OECD review. One of the very clear points they made, I think you've all mentioned at some point this morning, um, is that for all intents and purposes, we don't really teach curriculum for excellence in the senior phase. We teach curriculum for excellence in BGE, and then we teach to the test. Um, and your recommendations were about bridging that gap and allow, enabling us to actually deliver CFE as intended in, in the senior phase. Do you think that what the government has outlined so far will address that specific point of concern from the OECD, that there is poor articulation from BGE to senior phase? If I look constructively at what the government has said, and I look to the fact that um, they are going to look at the programmes of, of learning and to look at rebalancing the, the process, 
that they're setting up um, groups now to take forward the idea of project learning, although they're referring to it as interdisciplinary learning. Um, and if I um, look at the statement that says they're going to work with young people and teachers in order to consider what the personal pathway would look like, um, then I think there is the potential that um, we will end up with a system that is closer to the aspirations of curriculum for excellence. Um, I was reading a, a report um, of a colleague from um, university who was writing for the Irish government saying that report and um, using Scotland as a case study and looking at Scotland from the outside. And I thought she made a very interesting point to say that um, the, what um, Ireland could learn from Scotland is that simply having the aspiration of curriculum for excellence wasn't enough that um, we had to make sure that it was important uh, that the Irish government consider not just the curriculum, but also um, the pedagogy and also assessment and qualifications. Because if you don't have that single thread running through, then um, things don't go in the way that you would hope that they might. And her comment was that, that what Ireland could learn is that it had taken Scotland 20 years to get to the point where um, they were talking about the, the draft report from our group um, and saying that this looked now as if Scotland was going to take forward curriculum for excellence in the way that had originally been intended. Thank you, and thank you for all your work leading up to this point. Thank you very much. Thank you. Just before we go to Bolirini, George Adam wants to come in briefly. Thank you, Convener. Uh, morning, uh, everyone. One of the things I've been on this committee on and off all my time here, and teaching to the test is something I he I've heard from day one when I came in here. And we need to, how do we? My question is basically, how do we take this conversation forward? And one of the problems, Professor Hayward, you said yourself that you know, societal-wise, we actually put a lot of emphasis on exams and results. And uh, so how do we convince uh, the rest of the world? I think uh, Mr Bain mentioned uh, earlier on as well the fact that we need to have that conversation with parents, employers, you know, so that they actually have value, they buy in to the process. And I think that's one of the challenges we always face is getting that buy-in. We can discuss it and we can say this is the way forward, but out there in the real world, people say, what are you doing here? I've already had a text today from my very academic wife who's watched today's proceedings and says, all right, you know, and that's coming from somebody that's involved politically. You know, so how do we take that conversation forward and how do we get that out to the world say, this is, as you say, there are other ways of assessing people? Let me give you one possible way of doing this. The independent review group was set up with a particular purpose. It was, it, it was set up recognising that for curriculum and for qualifications and assessment to change requires society to change. And so the composition of the group that brought together those for whom qualifications matter most, that's learners and as appropriate their parents or carers, those who are involved in the design, development and offering qualifications, and essentially for any reform of qualifications to work, those who use qualifications have to be involved. So the universities and the colleges, the employers, the voluntary sector, all of these people have to be in the process. And each member of the independent review group was asked to set up a community collaborative group where they brought together people from across their community representing a diverse range of views. So for employers, for example, we ended up with three um, community collaborative groups. There was a community collaborative group that had membership from some of the big international companies um, who were involved in the process. We had a second community collaborative group that was public sector um, employers and a third that was SMEs. So, and they brought together their, their different communities. We had one for peer, all through the system. That can't stop with the publication of the report. Mm -hmm. Changing the process means that that process of engagement with all of these communities has to continue over time. Now, the independent review group 
already has the mechanism by which these conversations could continue. Because what, one of the things I think is remarkable is that um, uh, 18 months, well, 16 months down the line, that there is still such strong support across these different communities for the ideas that are contained within the report. So you have the basis of an organisational structure that would allow these conversations to continue and that process of feeding out into the wider system identified. So, for example, let's, let's think about the employer, since we've used that as an example. The question to each of these three groups would be, how now do we begin to engage with people in the community that you um, are engaged with? How do we begin to get some of these ideas into the system? They know their systems, they know their structures, they know their mechanisms, and they're the best people, therefore, to help us with that process. In terms of the school system, I would advocate that right now we should be talking to the parents who are bringing um, their young children into early years and primary to say, by the time your young people are um, in the senior phase, here are the exciting things that are going to happen and the kinds of rich experiences that they're going to have. So we have a very practical approach to making sure that there's a really good communication strategy and we use the people from their own communities to advise us on the best way to communicate with the different groups. But that process begins now. It grows over time. There was one other issue that I saw um, again. This was um, in Ireland, where um, when they were um, changing the an aspect of their education system. They developed um, adverts that they put on television and in cinemas to say, this is what the future will look like for... There was a little girl called Orla. You'll find it on YouTube, I'm sure, if you're interested. But it took the parents through. So we need to think creatively about the ways in which we're going to best communicate with the wider public, recognising that this is cultural change. And that group that IRG group and the community groups represented a way forward where cultural change can actually be reflected in the practices that we undertake. Mr Bain, you deal with the key, one of the key groups, uh, parents and themselves. Uh, they, they'll be the big one to try and convince that this is a way forward. Uh, how, how do you say you have that? Could you brought up the idea of the conversation? Uh, I'll cover the business one. Just oh, briefly right. first. Uh, having had a lot of conversation with Tracy Black uh, for the CBI and seen the reports that uh, was produced and recommendations there. I've also chaired a number, because my, my own school, or one of my own schools, is heavily involved in vocational education, I've had the opportunity to chair a number of construction summits uh, with, with regional businesses where we're discussing what schools need to be providing to young people to make their place in the world in the construction industry, in particular construction and engineering. They're basically coming back and saying that the bit of paper you get for the SQA has got a shelf life of about six months. Mm -hmm. They're not really interested in eh, that particular segment, those who are leaving school to go directly into work, in particular to construction industry. Eh, they want schools to produce youngsters with a set of core skills so that when they go to the, the business that they're ready to get <coughs> cracking. So, yeah, six months shelf life. So they've had that conversation, and I think it's, easy, it's easier to convince employers to move forward, especially when you're selling a, sell, a skills agenda-type mm -hmm. curriculum. In terms of the parents, there are, there are two main voices from the parent body. They are generally, both groups are actually generally influenced by their own school experience. If the parent uh, has had a particularly successful traditional schooling of academia, and the further back we go, the more academic it was in relation to the, the more balanced academic vocational split that we have in many, but not all, schools now, you'll find, yeah, five hires. Yeah, they have to get five hires. Mm -hmm. And they have to have English, math. They have to have a science. They have to have a language. Do you know? And what is have that? you met my wife then? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, they, and they'll come up with things like, why, why are they doing drama? Why are they doing uh, sports leadership? What's that nonsense all about? 
and then poor young person who actually wants to go to you know, a career where these additional qualifications are necessary. I'll give you a practical example. A PE teacher, someone who wants to go in uh, to be a PE teacher needs to go and get a degree, but to get into teacher education, particularly something like PE, where the, the numbers of applicants are massive, they're not necessarily just interested in whether they get five hours or not. What they actually want to see is, is the kid academically able to go through the degree process. But they're looking for things like national progression awards and sports leadership and strength and conditioning and refereeing and, and all these other things that the parent body generally consider to be Mickey Mouse subjects. But actual fact, they're not Mickey Mouse subjects at all. And there's a great deal of quality assurance to ensure that these are qualifications. I just noticed the referee in the room. Being a referee is not a Mickey Mouse book. These Mickey <laughs> Mouse people say that a lot about me, uh, I have to say. But uh, carry on, Mr Bain. So, well, you'll like this, because I'm being very supportive of your industry. This, yeah. uh, these, are, these experiences are the difference between that young person getting into their degree and making a success of their degree and going on and having a vocational experience. I could switch it to the other side and talk about engineering as well, where instead of just getting five hires in S5 and then another three hires in S6 and a couple of advanced hires, most engineering companies are not interested in that. In fact, universities, I hope I'm going to get backed up in a minute, are not interested in just clocking up hires. What they would like to see is that baseline academic acquisition and then a set of wider experiences and qualifications in that same type of environment. So if you were going to do a degree in engineering, for example, you might do your engineering at school, but you might also do a number of different NPAs in the same environment. The school, the local authority and the kid doesn't benefit from clocking up multiple hires, but what they do do is clock up experiences that allow them to more successfully navigate that university degree or that college place or move into the workplace. But parents don't get that. We are only just seeing in the last three or four years since COVID an expansion in national progression awards. In fact, you had Fiona Robertson here about six weeks ago or so talking about an expansion of national progression awards. It's only expanding because we're convincing parents through successful school experiences mm -hmm. or the next generation that it's working. So in my case, so say we started off with 28 national progression awards. We've now got about 400 or something because year after year, kids are going back into the homes and the parents are talking and go, see that MPA thing? Actually, my kid loved that. But societally, MPA, what's that nonsense? Get them a hire. Mm -hmm. Experience helps overcome uh, that, that mindset. And the last point is we have to be careful which parents we listen to because the, the ones with the loudest voices are probably the ones that went to uni did the hires and said, this is what we need. But actually, the ones we need to listen to are that 60 to 70 per cent who need the MPAs more than the fires. A few members still to come in, but Ms Barry, I think you wanted to, to respond and then a, a brief a response as well from Professor Hayward. Yeah, we disagree with Peter. I think it's too late if you are only going to start learning those, having those experiences when you start at university and you haven't had that in the lead up prior to entering university. But the point I wanted to come in and make was just to give an example round about some of the cultural change that's happened with changes in the system and, and how it's become normalised. An example of that is contextual admissions. So this was work that universities did across the sector to widen access and remove barriers for some of the most disadvantaged groups and some priority groups. Probably about 15 years in now, and I think when we started, the concern was that, you know, lots of parents would be concerned that their child was missing out because somebody else was having an adjusted contextual offer. But actually, there was real recognition that this was about levelling the playing field and that this was about understanding the context in which you're achieving your qualifications. And really, that was quite universally accepted. And I thought we would be challenged in universities at that point. And we have a little bit in the press, and we have a little bit by some parents, but by and large that cultural change has happened and we promote and advertise this as part of our admissions policies and on our website, and it's pretty well embedded and pretty normalised. So I think there is real possibility that we can take that cultural change to a different way of different qualifications and how they impact on different users of qualifications, whether that's employers, colleges or universities. Okay, thank you. Uh, Willie Rennie. So the Cabinet Secretary has framed this whole debate is about her plans being ambitious yet pragmatic, contrasting with those who want radical changes. So do you think the 
explanation of a lack of finance is just an excuse? Or do you think she just doesn't believe in, print, in the principles behind your report? I'd have to be able to read the Cabinet Secretary's mind in order to be able to answer that question. And I can't. So in, in not being able to do that, then I have to go on the statement that she made to Parliament, which um, is where I have taken the, the evidence that I brought to the committee today, or we brought to the committee today, in terms of the, the paper. So I have to um, believe that that has been done in good faith, and that what we're looking at is um, a, a pragmatic way to take um, ideas forward. We will never have a better chance. Um, it's very rare in Scottish education that you see the breadth of communities coming in behind a set of ideas in something that is so potentially contentious. If we're serious about getting it right for every child, then this is our chance to do that. And I hope we have the courage to take it. Your demeanour tells me something else, though. I mean, you're quite downbeat today. I think you're, you've talked about frustration, no vision. The, you, we, there's a danger of going too fast, but a danger also of going too slow, with the emphasis on the going too slow. Uh, I don't think you really believe the Cabinet Secretary is behind your report. I think, in a sense, um, that... Let me move to um, one of the points that Douglas made, which is that um, the Cabinet Secretary has made statements to Parliament which um, we base our current thinking on. Um, and then the question is, um, collectively as a society, do we think that these are the right things to, to do? And do we think that this is a direction that we should, we should go in? Um, and I think that I'm a great believer in, in getting things out onto the table. So if there are um, issues that we need to address, then let's name them and deal with them. And I think it's that very um, pragmatic approach now to moving things on. We have lots of examples from um, previous work done. For example, the Assessment is for Learning work in Scotland that was done um, where we have um, examples of asking schools, local authorities to try things out to see how things will work. So um, let's move with these. Let's actually begin the process of moving this on and um, doing it with people and making sure that all of the communities um, that Mr Adam referred to um, are continue to be part of that discussion. This is Scotland's future. So I, I was very interested in what Dr Hutchison said, because it's in terms of the responsibility is with the whole education community, with teachers, with leaders. And the implication from that was that the education secretary was a roadblock and that you would find a way of getting round her. Am I misinterpreting what you said, Dr Hutchison? <laughs> I think you are. Um, <laughs> I, I, do you know, well, she's I, not with you, is she? I mean, your demeanour today has been... I mean, you are seething. That your, your years of work has been ignored by the Cabinet Secretary. You're quietly seething. That's one of those wee black hole opens up and invites us to jump <laughs> into that wee black hole. Uh, <laughs> um, no, I, I, I would simply say again, um, you know, as... You, you were saying, you know, ambitious yet pragmatic, you know, and the question that occurs to me, is it about the Cabinet Secretary or is it about the Cabinet Secretary's reading of the system? You know, and we have talked about uh, bringing people uh, with us, and Peter mentioned, you know, league tables early on and pointed at the media. The media wouldn't have league tables if they weren't good clickbait. People like league tables, you know, like, so it is about convincing people... Uh, 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 as a system and building those coalitions and building that consensus that says there, there has to be a better way. Because the current convincing people that the current system privileges a certain type of learner and privileges a certain type of learning, and it's not the poorest that it privileges. So there are vested interests in maintaining the system exactly as it is. Uh, and so change is challenging. Change is challenging for parents, it's challenging for teachers, and teachers 
are cited often, you know, we need to take teachers with us. Teachers are up to their ears just trying to deliver, as Peter described there. So I, I, I don't think the leadership is going to come from teachers who are absolutely up to their ears and dealing with the daily stuff. It's people like us that need to take responsibility for building that coalition and convincing those with that leadership responsibility that this is uh, the right direction and the whole thing won't fall down. And I have a huge sympathy for people in leadership positions, having been, you know, head of education and director of education for 11 years now. And I mean, the convener will understand perfectly well every time you step onto a football pitch, there are 65,000 people there in an advisory capacity, but there's one person making the decision. And it's a bit like that in a leadership position. You don't want to break the system. You realise there are... So it is about convincing, exemplifying uh, and building coalitions around uh, the way forward that means we have a system uh, that, that meets the needs of all our young people and not just uh, a few of our young people. And that's not happening at the moment. So, Peter, um, you've been very straightforward. And this is an opportunity because you will not get many opportunities to tell the Cabinet Secretary directly um, what you think about the pace of progress. Um, you are frustrated. So what do you think she needs to do next in December? What's the next steps that you need to do in order to bring her more in line with your report? Uh, well, I'm not here to give any individual uh, opinions. I'm sharing the opinions that has been shared to me through... Uh, and I'm not here as president of SLS, but obviously... Yeah. I represent the members of SLS as a president and also uh, I'm a member of Bosch and as a head teacher of a number of collaboratives. And I led the IRG collaborative of school leaders who were all signed up to the recommendations. I was recently, along with Douglas, at the City Chambers where uh, the Cabinet Secretary led her first of three in fact, the other one is on Friday in Edinburgh. But City Chamber, first of three sessions with school leaders, listening to their views. And so their views that were shared at City Chamber just a couple of weeks ago, in fact, the opening sentence was, this programme is not ambitious. OK. At the moment, so we have to be fair to the Cabinet Secretary in that we have only seen the opening government and in December we may see, once she has listened to the school leaders, these three meetings, and listened to, and you will go back and talk to her, etc., we may see a more ambitious and holistic programme of reform that is not evident in the opening gambit. And we may still see that. What is definitely not clear to the school leaders that I represent at the moment and who wrote to me to tell me what to say today <laughs> is that at the moment we are not tackling or we do not seem to be tackling the main concerns that the school leaders have, which is over issues related to how we measure our success in Scottish education. We are being driven by five plus, so can the Scottish Government please work with the education community to develop a better way to measure the success of all young people and not just those who are going to uni. That's the most pressing concern that they have, and that's not mentioned anywhere in, the, in anything that's come out so far. The second is on parity of esteem is not being adequately promoted as a strategic... Uh, there's no strategic way forward to deal with the need to ensure a parity of esteem so that all young people's worth can be demonstrated to all levels of society when they leave school. And I've given examples of that earlier on. That's not tackled. The third most pressing call is over the two-term dash in stopping... We, and we shouldn't take away examinations. Right? So examinations are still an important part of our society, and for many, perhaps 30 to 40 per cent, they're a useful way of benchmarking and help universities, etc. What about the other 60 to 70 per cent? How can we develop an ass a qualifications and assessment system that allows not just some subjects have some exams, and, and this is the way that's been described as a way forward. Some exams, or all exams, would have some final exam and some uh, internal assessment. No, 
different subjects need different uh, assessment models to suit that particular qualification. And, and it's not just a one size fits all. And how do we benchmark that? Do we use the SEQF framework, for example? And that's probably the way forward. That's been tackled in the opening gambit by uh, the Scottish Government, and we welcome that as at least it's a move forward with something. And the last point uh, that I would raise is that the profession would like to see, as uh, Professor Haver has just outlined, a continuation of a similar uh, systematic approach to reviewing the whole of the Scottish education framework and not cherry picking the bits that we can afford whilst appreciating that the Cabinet Secretary is under fiscal uh, constraints, we can still relatively cheaply do two things. One, we could continue the work of the IRG and community collaboratives that we've already established with some people who already have an experience in that discussion, and we could mo move forward into a stage two, which is implementation groups, where we can actually work out if these recommendations would work or not. And by that, I mean we could have members of the IRG sitting with uh, doing model schools and say, right, say, take the personal pathway that I mentioned earlier. Bosch, for example, has just recently said that they would volunteer their schools up to be uh, models for parts of the SDA. So let's go a half a dozen schools through SLS or Bosch or through uh, ADES and go, right, well, you pilot this and tell us what works and what doesn't work. And do the same with... Uh, you know, the project learning part as well. And then we can actually go back with and legitimately say this will work and it won't work. So they've dipped their toe in the water and that's welcomed, but let's get cracking with implementation groups because they're not expensive because we're not actually heavily investing and we shouldn't heavily invest until we know it's going to work. Thanks very much. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Bill Kidd. Uh, thank you, Kandina. Um, pardon the modulation of my tone at the moment, but I've no, no particularly well. Uh, anyway, but um, right, you've given us practically all the answers to what I'm going to ask you anyway, but this is your opportunity just to sort of keep punting your, your, um, your points of view. So the government response says that further activity will play, take place uh, considering key elements of the independent review's recommendations, um, probably in starting in December at least. Uh, such as leaving certificate interdisciplinary learning, modularisation of subject qualifications and such like. Um, and you have given us some really strong answers already, but are there any particular areas of your recommendations that do you need, really must be explored further by the government? Because this is your opportunity, they'll be listening into what's being said. Is there something that you really need to be picked up on? Please. I think there are a range of th uh, things that actually both Peter and, and, and Douglas and Shona have all uh, picked up on. But I think that it's looking at the recommendations as a whole and thinking about, um, so for example, issues like, um, uh, as Peter said, I always think that reform is like if you take the back from an old fashioned watch and you have all these little cogs that turn. Now, if one of the cogs jams, the watch stops. So if, for example, we look at changing the qualification system, but we don't look to change the data that we gather, then that will have a negative washback on the success of the qualifications. If, as a community, we don't continue to engage with other communities, so for example, if we don't continue to talk to, with the universities or the employers so that they ask for the Scottish Diploma of Achievement when young people are entering university or they ask for it when a young person is going into employment, then that will damage the system. If school inspectors, when they go into schools, don't look for the kinds of behaviours and practices that are recommended in terms of the new approaches to qualifications. That's another cog that jams. So therefore, what um, I think we're hoping for in the December statement is seeing how these ideas um, become embedded in this wider picture of reform for Scottish education. But colleagues may have other ideas that they would like to add to that. 
I, I, I agree that it, it's, it's difficult to single out one, one piece. And to go back to the question over here about how do you get away from teaching to the test, it's kind of my answer would be related to that. And the answer is let's focus on the learning. And qualifications and assessment are a way of cashing in your learning. And if you think about the learning that children and young people do in school, they do so much more than is captured in an SQA certificate. Uh, and so the Diploma of Achievement was essentially about saying, let's capture and celebrate and articulate that so much more. I mean, I met on Monday with uh, 10 uh, S6 pupils from various Glasgow schools. I worked my way around the school captains in small groups. Uh, and we had a conversation about this. But in order to become the kind of head boy or girl or school captain, they had to go through an application process. They were interviewed. They had to give a speech to their peers. They were voted on by their peers, voted on by teachers. There's a huge amount of learning goes on in that process. How is that captured? We don't have a Nat 5 activism, and yet we have some of the most activist children and young people uh, in our schools. Uh, challenging uh, racism and uh, homophobia and a whole range of other things, that activism isn't captured in an SQA certificate. The Diploma of Achievement was saying, let's capture the so much more learning that goes on. So let's focus on the learning. And the Diploma of Achievement was saying, that's where we'll capture it. It's really an important part of what goes on. But at the moment, we privilege the SQA certificate. We privilege the exam certificate. That's what's celebrated on the 8th of August or whenever it is as the exam results come out, kids opening their envelopes and going through that charade. Um, it, this is about moving away. So if we want to move away from teaching to the test, let's celebrate everything, every aspect of learning that goes on throughout the 15 years children and young people spend in school. So it is a shift, and that's how you get away from teaching to the test. So the Diploma of Achievement for me is about a way forward in relation to that just to add one thing to that. And also, this is about getting it right for every child. But within that group, it's also about getting, right, getting it right for these young people who are going to go on um, into university or college. Because universities' assessment approaches have changed radically. Um, and the kinds of um, skills and attributes that the Scottish Diploma of Achievement is includes are the kinds of um, experiences that young people will have when they go into university. So we've got to make sure, and, and you see in countries across the world who are developing these kinds of ideas. And what we don't want is to be in a position where Scottish students, no matter where they go, are disadvantaged compared to other um, stu students from other contexts um, who are engaging in the kinds of activities that are contained within the Scottish Diploma of Achievement. But our, our, our young people are used to sitting exams, and that's what they go beyond with. And then they go into university, and they're faced with a whole range of approaches to assessment that they have never had access to before. So it's about the culture, then, about how teaching takes place and, and how learning takes place more than it is actually just, oh, look what I've achieved, here's a bit of paper or something like that sort of thing, you know, I mean, well, that is important, of course, but, but it's how they learn and how they feel about the learning as well, is it? It's all of that, and fundamentally it's saying, it, it's Douglas's comment about so much more. Um, this isn't about radically changing all of Scottish education. It is about recognising more of what already goes on in Scottish education and helping and supporting Scottish education to move in these areas that were always the intention of Curriculum for Excellence, but because they weren't part of the qualification system, became invisible in the process. Well, thank you. I don't know if uh, Peter Bain, you get something. Hey. Two things. One thing I want to chip in earlier that's really important, uh, and it's to do with the ACM, the Alter Alternative Certification Model that uh, Douglas mentioned earlier. Much of uh, the media reports uh, and comments made in Parliament on that, uh, and by the SQA themselves, I've heard Fiona Robertson talking about this, saying that you know, ACM didn't work, and that uh, it didn't work because of the workload on teachers. And that is being used as evidence that we shouldn't move 
to more wholesale uh, internal assessment. Right, I've heard that used as evidence multiple times. That is not entirely true. The ACM model did work for those schools who predicted that we would need an ACM model. So what happened after the second lockdown, and when we moved into the second time where the exams were uh, not held, we, certain schools predicted that we weren't going to have exams in year two and we'd probably need internal assessment, and they predicted that in the summer before the session even began and planned out to do, to do internal assessment across the year, predicting that a similar thing to the first year would happen and we would need all this internal evidence. And the schools that did that and spread the load in advance of the SQA's announcement, they did not report workload issues. Far from it. They were quite happy. They used the natural internal assessment that they had to do to progress with the learning and they just evidenced it ready to provide evidence in the event there were no exams. These schools were very happy, content with ACM. The schools that complained about the workload issues were the schools that waited for the SQA to cancel the exams, and that didn't come till February. No wonder we had teachers complaining about workload issues suddenly trying to accumulate a bank of evidence in February that proved that from June all the way to February these kids had been passing their assessments. ACM worked as long as it was planned. We could do ACM quite comfortably again as long as we said that's what we were going to do and we gave everybody plenty of notice and there's no a workload issue because you've got to naturally assess as you go through the course anyway. And if you remove the exams in that five, at that five level, you free up more time for, as Douglas says, learning about your subject, learning the skills and no learning how to pass the test. We just need to make that decision. The second thing I would uh, just finish with is on the SDA itself. The, the whole concept of pushing forward the SDA with its three component parts as a single unit was essential to ensure that we recognise the worth of all learners, not just those that could pass the programme of learning element of it. The interdisciplinary part of it, uh, the project learning part of it, as it's properly titled, was essential so that we can learn, uh, teach and learn in context because that's what employers want to see and it's a better way of embedding learning. And the personal pathway was also essential to recognise that in society we are not just producing learning and skills, uh, uh, knowledge and learning, knowledge and skills acquisition. We also have to produce young citizens, and we also have to recognise the wider experiences that they get from being a young carer, whatever. If you don't deliver a certification that acknowledges all three parts, all we'll do is go back to seeing kids waving a certificate about in August. Civil servants have advised me that we can't legislate to, to publicise the, the award system in any shape or form. I don't know how accurate that is, and that's something for parliamentarians to consider. But what I would ask you to consider is to find a way to deal with what Douglas has described. The SQA publish traditional awards in August which are like the hires that I teach, etc., and everybody waves their five or their three or whatever bits of paper. See the National Progression Awards and the Skills Awards uh, and the PDAs and every other, every other award that contributes to the worth of a child. They are not published until into September. Yet, the me and nobody's interested in September because we've all had the media where we're all waving <coughs> a bit of paper about. If and this sounds very simplistic, and this is why head teachers are frustrated, their school leaders are frustrated. Why can we not find a system that prevents any of our agencies from publishing the awards for last year, but all in one day? Because if we did that, that would support parity of esteem and ensure that there's a, an equitable uh, success story for our youngsters. Stop publishing the hires in August and everything else in September. Publish everything in September. Wait. If, if Parliament can wait and local authorities can wait and the media can wait till September and a kid can come with a bit of paper that says, I've got my refereeing certificate that's going to help me get my PE job, but equally I've got my higher history that will get me to do my history degree. 
that seems very small and insignificant, and nobody's really picking it up. But that would secure parity of esteem in the mindset of our society to a large degree, and answer Douglas's point. Thank you. Thank you. And Shona, that would benefit your <coughs> university as they come forward to you, then, would it? Absolutely. I mean, I think um, the sector isn't homogenous, right? We've got different institutions, different sizes, you know, different approaches. But my experience over the last few years is that we are really opening our minds to different types of learning and where that learning's been gained, whether that's in the workplace, experiential learning, through professional qualifications, through college, not only from school. Um, and it's a lot of work then that I'm currently working on to recognise that type of learning, to translate it to the Scottish Qualifications Framework, to translate that to a level to say, right, OK, they, somebody didn't do this formal qualification, but they've got this, this and this, they've got other experiential learning, and we can form a holistic picture to, to see, is this going to be a successful student and are they going to have a successful outcome? So I think there's a real move away from just being... The currency of university admissions teams was always qualifications and hires, and I think that mindset has been shifting, particularly the work we're doing in widening access, to recognise a really broad range and that there's no single path into university, and it's not only about leaving school into university, you can come through any number of different routes. So I think there's, there's a, a real shift and perhaps more progressive thinking around about how universities use qualifications. And that was Peter just getting a raise in his wages there, was it, um, because of what he said? <laughs> Arm to remind us that we're supposed to have 90 minutes with our witnesses, Sorry. and that has now expired. <laughs> uh, and several other members want to come in, so if we can, uh, possibly, I know it's uh, a, a lot of information to get out, uh, if we can constrain some of the answers. And if something's already been said, there, there's no need to repeat it. But thank you, Bill, and I'll take in Miles Briggs. Thank you, Convener. Good morning to the panel. Thanks for joining us uh, today. Um, the Government's 2023 consultation found mixed views on the proposals of the independent review and I know last year Professor Hayward you said that the independent review's report reflected an agreed position and you've outlined the working groups which have um, produced that so could I ask the panel to explain the differences in the findings of the government's consultation and the consultation um, undertaken by the independent review and given we're all waiting to hear what the cabinet secretary will say in December is your concern that the 26 recommendations you've put forward, that the low-hanging fruit of that is what the government seemed to be content with? Bring yourself in. Professor. I think Peter has already addressed the, the issue of the first part of that question in that the context in which we found in the review that um, people who came to documentation cold um, tended to react. And if you read that report, Often, the, the, I, I'm not suggesting put two people in a room and ask them a question of education and you'll get two different mm -hmm. views. So the idea of consensus as being everyone is, you know, is a pipe dream. Um, of course, there are people who are going to hold, hold different views. But what we, had, what we have in the group is a very wide and broad agreed position, people, something that people can live with. Often in the Cabinet Secretary's response, I think people were looking at the, the ideas cold, and Peter outlined the difference between um, when people had an opportunity to talk things through, when they thought about the vision of what it is they're trying to achieve, then you see um, ideas trying to change. Well, Douglas also raised the issue of the fact that um, teachers are really busy people um, and that they do need time to think things through and to be supported um, in that process of, of thinking things through. So, you know, in the, 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 the documentation that it, the Cabinet Secretary's consultation was, was very helpful because it was extending um, the numbers of teachers who were involved. But through the process, we also, through the process of the review, we engaged with teachers systematically through the process. And what we found was that, as uh, Peter said, people were well-intentioned um, in terms of what we were trying to achieve and were happy to work with us as long as they were supported in that process. Thank you for that. Anyone else want to add? 
Uh, yeah, I already answered that uh, to a degree in the, the beginning, and it is all about understanding. If you ask anybody something <coughs> without understanding, they're going to give you a subconscious conservative uh, viewpoint, one that uh, people don't like change, they don't react well to it. If you explain why you want change and how you would go about supporting that change, then their viewpoint will change. Without having a discussion how you're going to support the change process, you're going to get a negative answer mm -hmm. to change no matter what the subject is. Mm -hmm. We actually found the same thing during the IRG itself. We, we were at odds with why were some of the community collaboratives coming back with positive ways forward with certain elements. And then when we were going out to schools, we were getting a different... So we already identified that, which is why we upped the number of visits. So uh, Louise and I uh, and other members of the IRG went to schools and talked to more kids and sat and talked to, like Douglas does, talk to le school leadership teams and explain it, and then that, that changes their viewpoint. Mm. Well, one of the interesting points which I, you raised earlier was where we've seen a change in terms of pupils and the 20% of pupils we've been talking about um, who aren't achieving uh, an at five level. The, the fact that they're still in school between S4 and S5, which has maybe changed to some extent from when I was last in, at secondary school and and so looking at the positive destinations which the government talk about um, I, I wanted to understand more the government's response has said they'll look at the possibility of a, a leaving certificate um, but you've outlined what you would see proposed in the diploma for achievement what value that would then have and I think for the college sector um, that's quite clear for apprenticeship and um, development but for employers to be able to understand what skill set you are literally taking a young person in at, and, and just wondered what work had gone on around that, um, and where the government, although they're saying they're looking towards a possibility of that, whether or not that's just going to have missed the point which you put forward, basically. Yeah. I think that um, all the conversation always concentrates on national qualifications. When I think that what my colleagues have said is that um, Scotland offers a myriad of different kinds of qualifications. Um, and it's important that all these are, are recognised. And I think Peter has made the, the point most commonly that just now, because all our attention only focuses on one part, we're naturally excluding a wide range of, of young people who are adult learners who achieve qualifications that employers value in different kinds of ways. So I think that um, it is, uh, there is a very clear opportunity here to try to redress some of this balance, but also to make sure that our conversations with employers continue so that employers are also kept abreast of the kinds of qualifications that young people will come to them with and the ways in which they will meet the, their needs um, as employers, as well as the needs of the young people who are engaged in them. But Peter, you might want to take that one up. Just to repeat again, I'm conscious what Kendi was saying about uh, repeating ourselves. I do think the entire system is driven for the benefit of the top 30%, a top 30% attaining pupils of traditional subjects. All our discussions always gravitate to that. Let's take a responsibility as leaders of education to protect the 60 to 70 per cent of our kids. We talk about uh, you know, the, the need for exams with all these kids. We're talking about 20 per cent not even getting one. What about the other 10 per cent that maybe get two or three or four, or, or do they fall below the five plus national five, for example? They're not getting exams. You know? So if we're saying exams are so important, are we actually by default saying, that we're not delivering an effective Scottish education system for 60% of our kids that fall below the five plus, or, or more than 50% that fall below the five plus, because they're only getting Nat fours. I don't believe that. I think that the youngsters that are going through Nat four courses and MPs at that level and wider experiences, I think that Scottish schools and local authorities are providing a very good educational experience for these youngsters, which is why positive destinations and a lot of low attaining schools are actually very high because the, the schools in particular areas uh, 
where there are more kids going into work, for example, they are being better prepared. We should be celebrating their success on a national forum and through a national statistical opportunity that we're not now because we're too busy celebrating five plus kids that are going to uni. And they are important. They are crucially important. But they, are, they only make up less than half of our youngsters. That we need to celebrate everybody. It's that simple. And we're not doing that mm. at all. Um, just fine. I, I don't doubt that. I think all of us around this table um, you know, want to see that. You said earlier the worth of all <coughs> learners. I think that's important. Um, but this idea around a Scottish Diploma of Achievement is an award. And for people to understand then the skill set you've mentioned, <coughs> credit, um, competence, core skills, I'm not quite clear on how that will then, as, a, as an employer, straight in from school, what level of literacy, numeracy, you'll be able to then understand that individual coming into your business will have. And I just wondered, in terms of actually putting the flesh and the bones of that, whether yeah. or not yourselves or the Scottish Government, in the work you've been doing with them, have even taken that forward? We've looked at using the SCQF framework for that, which tends to be a kind of language, I think, that is, if it isn't um, in increasingly being understood it should be in, in increasingly being understood and what the re review recommended was that um, we would hold the programs of learning as now so where there were grades um, they would they would remain when it got into um, pro project learning then young people would undertake projects at different SCQF levels and they would then get the credit associated with particular levels, depending on the level of challenge engaged in the project. Not, not graded, but within that kind of framework. So as an employer, you could look at that and say, this is level six, which is the equivalent of... And then the third part, which was the personal pathway, um, we argued that it wasn't appropriate to um, assess or grade or categorise it. But the important thing in that was not about the number or the location of the experiences, but it was what learning had taken place. So it would be the young person reflecting on what they had learned through these experiences, how these experiences had helped them decide that actually the firm that you're offering the post in would be a good firm for them and this was a good job for them. And they would then be able to talk to you about that. Employers told us that they felt a certain frustration that often when they were interviewing young people, they really didn't have much to talk about. They mm -hmm. found it hard to make these connections. And we thought, therefore, that the personal pathway was a way of giving them that bank of knowledge. They could talk about the knowledge and the skills that they developed in their subjects. They could then talk about the projects that they had undertaken, where they were using these skills and relate that to the kinds of um, competences that you as an employer would find useful in, um, in their role in your company. Yeah. Does that, is that? Yeah. No. Yeah. It was also designed to ensure that parity of steam and that equitable opportunity for wider experiences for all. I'm going to flip my practical example to a, a, a school that may have a, a traditional exam success rate of maybe 60 or 70 per cent. That still means there's 30 per cent of youngsters who are not hitting that natural benchmark that they're aiming for. What are they getting out of school? Or they're probably getting a lot out of school, but it's not recognised anywhere. So that's 30 per cent of even a high attaining school. Uh, and, and how do they go to an employer uh, uh, and have that recognised? But equally, I mentioned, and uh, it was picked up earlier, about the curriculum being warped to hit those particular metrics. The curriculum, the timetable is designed to maximise the amount of hours in traditional subjects at the expense of having interdisciplinary learning experiences, so teaching and learning in context. It's designed to maximise the amount of time in traditional subjects that take away from the opportunity for young people to sit and consider what their worth is and what their wider experiences bring to them and how they can uh, formulate that away and publish that in a way that employers are going to benefit. So that 30 per cent that are not hitting that five plus metric, they should really be given the time to think about the wider experiences, to do wider experiences, to publish wider experiences in a format employers can pick up on. 
and to they maybe learn better in a traditional subject, so that interdisciplinary learning opportunities would be better delivered. Schools are not creating timetables to allow that to happen. Right? If we had a compulsory SDA with three equally valued component parts, schools and local authorities would have to realign their curriculum and their timetable to give time out of traditional subjects that support whatever percentage to ensure that when a young, all young people leave school, they have had personal experiences, they are able to sell those, they have had the opportunity to learn and be taught in context, as well as having the subjects. That's what the SDA forces on schools. It, it stops the warping of the curriculum to benefit only traditional subjects in 5+. plus. It ensures that our society will have young people who are more, uh, who are, who are more broadly educated. Can I just add one tiny point to that? that in, um, and already, um, Education Scotland and um, SQA are beginning to tackle some of these issues. You know, that there, there's a group already looking at timetabling. There's a group already looking at interdisciplinary learning. That these things are beginning. So the seeds are there, but we need to support them to grow. And we need to look at the broader range of communities who can help us in that process that will help us build the pace that we need in order to make sure that no child in Scotland is left behind. Thanks for that. Thanks, Convener. Uh, John Mason. Thanks very much, Convener. Um, I'm relatively new to the committee, and so some of the jargon escapes me slightly. So forgive me if I'm asking you obvious questions. But it, the, the, the leaving certificate and the Scottish Diploma of Achievement have already been mentioned uh, by two of my colleagues. Are they exactly the same thing? When we use these two terms, are they the same thing? I think so. Um, that the, the leaving certificate was, I mean, it may be a signal that um, we might be looking for a, a different name, perhaps, than other than the Scottish Diploma of Achievement. It was just our best shot at coming up with something that, I mean, we'd th we talked originally about perhaps a, the, using the term Scottish Baccalaureate, because in essence, the Scottish Diploma of Achievement has much in common with, the, with ideas of international baccalaureate. Uh, but there was a kind of reaction against the term baccalaureate, and so um, we then thought through. So Scottish Diploma of Achievement was, was the best we came up with in the time that we had available. So when I saw the term leaving certificate, I could be misinterpreting, um, but uh, what I thought was being said was that, yes, bringing these three components together, but we may think through what we actually call this. It may be a different name other than the Scottish Diploma of Achievement. Okay, so it's, uh, not, at least that reassures me a bit that I'm not uh, fully misunderstanding. Uh, now, I mean, the government's response to this seems to be that they had concerns about uh, risks of entrenching and exacerbating social inequity or whatever, and the example was given of richer kids going on a skiing holiday. So, but that wouldn't be the kind of thing that was in it. So, I mean... A, is the government's response fair, or are they misunderstanding what you're intending? And B, can we expand a little bit on exactly what would be on there, on this certificate? Would it be a book? Would it be 10 pages, 20 pages, one page? It would be um, online. So it would, it, it would be sort of like the idea of an extended LinkedIn, <laughs> almost, that you know, is, is part of the system. Um, where people would have um, within this um, online um, profile, there would be evidence of um, the courses or the, um, the, the qualifications that had been undertaken. There would be evidence of the project learning and the level of the SQA achieved within project learning. And these would be um, controlled nationally, so that SQA, for example, or its successor organisation, would feed into that the, the, the evidence of the, the qualifications and the, the evidence of project learning. What was proposed was that project learning, would that area would be different and that would be owned by the young person. So, or the, the adult learner. But the learner would have um, the opportunities to insert 
into that area what they thought was useful, and that would then become the basis, for example... So would it be entirely subjective? It depends what you mean by entirely subjective. For example, things well, like... If, if somebody said something that wasn't true, would the, would the teacher or the school or somebody no. correct that? Yes. What we said was that it wouldn't be assessed, but it would be validated. So a teacher would say, yes, this did happen, or no, this... It, well, <clears throat> if it was no, this didn't happen, it would be removed. So it would be... But it would be that kind of process of um, reflection with the teacher. Um, but that area, the young person would decide ultimately what went in it. I mean, some so of that would appear in the CV, awards, wouldn't it? it could be... Yes, I mean, a good CV would have that. If there were school captain, for example, they would put that in their CV. So I, I, as an employer, will know that. But, I mean, I'd also be interested, for example, in the young person who's a carer. Now, they're caring for a sibling. They're going home every day and helping the younger brother or sister or whatever with their life. Yep. Now, I want to know that as an employer. Would that appear on the leaving certificate? That could appear, but that's one of the things that actually there was a great deal of debate about within the, within the committee. We talked about um, with uh, the groups about, for example, the skills that young carers develop, um, which are substantial in terms of organisational skills, linking perhaps with um, multi-agencies. All of these things are really um, sophisticated skill sets um, and it was our intention that um, that would be uh, located within something like the personal pathway. Um, when we spoke with um, young carers, some, some don't want to disclose. And so we felt that we had no right to impose on young carers. So having a teacher, though, working with them to say, what are the skills that you have developed? And these skills that are developed could be contained within the, the personal pathway, whether or not the young person discloses uh, that or not. But that was the important thing, uh, Mr Mason, about this being in the control of the young person. It would be developed in partnership with teachers, with the teacher, but actually the control of it would be the young person. And when, you, when they were going to, um, uni to college or to university or to employment, then that would be there as a resource that they could draw on to give them an evidence base for what they might put in. To, they would make visible to the employer or to the university that which they wanted the mm. university or the employer to see. OK, I mean, that's helpful. Um, I mean, yes, OK, um, Mr Bain, can example, I just ask one other thing, and you can maybe yeah. comment on this as well. Does this... I think the Cabinet Secretary is saying this is a longer-term thing. Or uh, Now, does it have to be longer-term, or...? Can it be shorter term? No, absolutely not. It doesn't have to be long term at all. It could be short. It'll take as long as it takes to develop an IT program that allows us to record that. Because Scottish schools are already doing all three component parts of the SDA, but they're doing it in isolation and they're not combining that information in one place. So the only delay is, well, A, you have to have an implementation group to, to map out uh, the direction of travel. You need to develop the software that would allow it to be captured. I'm led to believe that that could easily be done. You'd, okay, there's a cost implication. You've got to pay a private company to, to build the software. Or you could get somebody like Seamus to do it, which is the operating system for all Scottish schools that already exists. Or you could get SDS to do it. But it's already been done. So if you develop the IT system that allows the capture of the CV material, for want of a better phrase, and it's accessible by the SQA, or Qualification Scotland, that's it's going to be. Qualification Scotland, using the candidate number, would be able to press a button, and when the qualifications through the exam system that still exists go through, that would automatically populate the candidate number, the, per the young person's qualifications part, or learning programme part, of the online CV. So, so what, maybe two or, three, two or three years? I, I don't know how long it would take to develop an IT programme, but I wouldn't imagine it would take more than a couple of years. Okay. But you still have to do the training for the staff, yeah, etc., yeah, sure. so that, that still needs to be built in. The interdisciplinary learning part, if, if it's timetabled in, would be delivered largely by teachers. And there's an, I, there's an initial teacher education part of that that would need to be considered. But schools, every school is doing interdisciplinary learning, but it's, they're not doing it in necessarily a nationally structured way that would allow uh, benchmarking to appear that would trigger the, the success on the online CV. But again, they're already doing it. 
We just need to fall, go through the national assessment of that well, to right. validate it to then have it added to the online CV. Okay, and the Edward, last part is the kids' part, that and that point. can be done in PS Ed. Just very briefly to say that already work is underway with um, related to the My World of Work, which would be the kind of basis of the sort of thing that, right. that Peter is um, is describing. Okay, that's good. I don't know, no, the two. Okay, thanks, Camille. Uh, thank you. Jackie, I know that was kind of moving on to your area. Is there anything you want to add? Yeah, I just I was going to actually ask what the barriers were, um, you know, current, what the barriers are currently with the interdisciplinary learning in our senior phase. I know you've touched on it briefly. Is there any other barriers that you'd maybe like to, to bring up? I think Peter's comment about um, schools are already doing this. Mm -hmm. I, I think... Um, I think many schools are already doing it, but some are further along the lines than others. And so within the, uh, the report's recommendations, what we proposed was that there are some things that, it, that it's sensible to do locally, but there are some things that it's sensible to do nationally. So let's say, for example, schools um, in, um, were involved, as Peter had outlined already, in developing um, I, examples of project learning then uh, as these were developed, then these would be held centrally and made available to schools across the country. Mm. Not that they could just lift and use, because different schools are in different sets of circumstances, but they could adapt them into their own environments. So it would give a supported path to schools where this perhaps is a more novel idea than in others. Can I, can I if you're saying that schools can adapt to suit their needs, does that not maybe cause a problem that then schools start doing different things to different other schools? Um, well, let me give an example. I, I, in life, that happens. I'm just not blaming schools for doing that. No. I think that, um, you know, it, it, everybody doesn't have to do the same thing. True. And what you have is that our recommendation was that we work within the SCQF framework which gives a set of standards at different levels in the system. And so it is the different standards that would bring the schools together. So they may do things that look very different, but if they're at the same level of challenge within that framework, then actually whether they do it in, uh, whether it's in a fishing community or whether it's in, um, if it's in an urban environment, then actually doesn't matter, the contextualisation doesn't matter. What matters is that the piece of work is at an agreed standard. Okay. I'll totally get you now. Sorry, I mis misinterpreted. Uh, Mr Baynard, you oh, just, just to say that already occurs in national qualifications at the moment, just to use my own subjects as an example, uh, there is a standardisation uh, to what we're trying to achieve within the subject. But I could be teaching Germany, but a school down the road could be teaching Russia, another school could be teaching America. Mm -hmm. Etc. So that already occurs. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, could I uh, pass on the thanks to the committee, to Professor Hayward and our other witnesses today, not just for your contribution here, but the work with the review. Uh, I think the fact that we've overran uh, a bit shows the interest uh, across the committee, and I think we and you will be looking on with interest to what the Cabinet Secretary says in December, uh, and who knows, we may be keen to get you back again, but we will um, wait and see what the Government come forward with uh, and the final uh, response later on this year. Uh, so that that concludes the public part of our proceedings and we will now suspend to allow the committee to consider our private items. Thank you.